Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 42, Life, the Universe, and More Catan. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me, live from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone here in the lobby on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and continue on even after the double bell ends the show for more Off the Books After Show. For those of you who aren't here live, if you want to hear the audio from the after show chats, as well as our pre-production or pre-show chatting, all you got to do is back our Patreon at the $4 level or higher. You also get other cool stuff like access to our Discord channel and pre-production show notes. Now, today for our main topic, we're talking about moving on from Catan. Now, after that, I'm going to be talking, uh, taking a look at the Colonies expansion for Terraforming Mars, Tiny Towns, and Brass Birmingham. And I've got a couple of rounds of the Duke. Oh, nice to hear that's gotten back to the table. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of those interactions with you fine folk. We share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions that we've been part of on social media. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media where we can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is a detailed comment from Emmett O'Brien about last week's topic, which was game room improvements. Now, Emmett writes, some thoughts on your suggestions. These are compromises more than solutions to your issues, but they might be handy on a budget. Chairs. One of my friends is energetic and big. We all have gamer friends like that, I think. Uh, sorry, that wasn't Emmett. That was me. He has a habit of destroying chairs. I had to reinforce my dining room table chairs with steel from when he came over. Since then, we've discovered restaurant supply websites sell chairs for $40, and they're all steel, except the seat, and very durable. Sound, Ryobi, R-Y-O-B-I, has a system of wireless portable speakers that can be moved around because they're battery-powered. Wi-Fi can mess with them, and that's my biggest gripe about it. They used to be really expensive, but the price has dropped. Lighting. There are some really slim options for lighting, and they're reasonably priced. I've installed a lot of these, and they're really bright. Now, here Emmett gave us a link to some LED flat panel troffer, I think was the brand, troffer lights, or maybe that's the style of light. Uh, Sean, you're the lighting expert. Maybe you've been in my game room. What do you think? Well... I feel like while mounting them may be a bit of a concern because I'm not quite sure what's above the uh, the ceiling there and, and positioning of, of the existing pot lights, uh, the 2x4 troffer lights may be the thing, and I'm actually considering swapping out the old fluorescent I've got in here uh, <laughs> with one as well because I've stopped using it just because, well, fluorescents are evil. Um, the only thing I have to say about those Ryobi sound uh, speaker system is what I find is with things like that, every time you need it, the batteries are dead. So mm. your mileage may vary depending on, uh, on charging options. Uh, now next we've got another detailed comment this time from Kristen from cats and dice. Her comment is in regards to our competition episode. And she writes interesting post when recommending games, I will also ask players how competitive they want their gaming experience to be. I think a lot of players newer to the hobby have only experienced games like monopoly and risk, which are both ultra competitive. While obviously there's nothing wrong with competition if you like it, it's good for players to know there are alternatives. Board games with a strong focus on personal score go a long way towards curbing competitiveness too. While games like Azul and Wingspan certainly have a winner and loser, they're not at all that in your face about it, especially during gameplay. Now, the only thing I would add to this is to just watch for people who don't actually realize how competitive they want games to be. I've met many a gamer who shows up and is like, oh, it's I love it. I want in your face. I want competition. Best man wins. Best person wins. Sorry. Best person wins. Yet they're the first people to complain when there's a direct player interaction and they get screwed over by another player. Uh, personally, when I'm 
trying to pick games out, I aim lower on the competitive scale than what people usually indicate. Uh, if they say a really head-to-head, face-to-face game, I'm still going to pick something on a lower scale. Now, we continue to get comments on our YouTube video where Sean and I basically read through the Gloomhaven FAQ. Uh, the most recent comment was from Tony James 98 who writes, Thank you for this video. We just started this week. Wish we knew about the keep gold and XP if you fail a scenario before. That would have made things much more fun. The other dumb thing we did for the first couple scenarios was use the class attack modifier deck instead of starting with the base modifier deck. The rulebook did not explain this well for first timers. I'm really still blown away by the reaction we get to this video. It was kind of just mm. something we did to fill a schedule gap, and yet it's turned into our most viewed content. Yeah, it's it's not something I would have expected to take off. It seems people dig listening to FAQs. Uh, due to how well this has been going, Sean and I were talking about this uh, when he was down in Windsor last weekend, about possibly doing more of these. What I'm not sure is what would be most useful to you, our listeners. What I want to know is what game do you think needs a detailed FAQ read-through and discussion? Now, there would be one caveat to that. I'd probably help if we'd at least played the game, or at least one of us has played the game. We could read through games we've never played. That could be interesting, too, but I think we probably need that background. But I would love to know if there's a game out there you want us to talk about the rule problems, FAQ, errata, issues we've had playing the game, and uh, things people often miss. Let us know on social media or through email at mo at tabletopbellhop.com. Thanks, everyone, for the game suggestions and comments. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Don't forget, if you're here live, we continue the show after the Double Bell in an Off the Books After Show, as well as some special features that might make it onto YouTube. Now, surely we've got some Catan fans in our chat room tonight. Lots of people start off with Catan. What I want to know is where you move to next. Once you put Catan away, what did you play next? We'll be back checking in with the chat room throughout the show. We are here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way to get questions through is through the website. They don't get missed that way. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Well, now, David has a problem. His local game group is stuck on one game. That game is Settlers of Catan. We're going to try and help David and his group out. This question comes in from the website where David R.Y. or Rye, what writes, I have some friends who only want to play Catan. I got invited to what I thought was a board game night, but was actually just their regular Catan tournament style night. And I'm wondering, what would be some good follow-up games? They've been interested in Ticket to Ride and Takanoko, but neither have the same feel of the trading player interaction and dice rolling chance part of the resource collecting. Plus, they all love the ability of the robber to screw someone over. Any help? Well, thanks for the question, David. Um, I've actually seen this problem quite often over the years, but sometimes it's not a problem. Like I know many groups that find a game they love and stick with it year after year after year. People who just game groups that stick to one game and there's nothing wrong with that. If your group digs Catan and only ever wants to play Catan, that's fine. Now I find this especially common though in RPG circles. That's actually, I think more common than people to play a lot of different RPGs where a group is going to find the one system they dig and stick with it. And while RPGs are designed for this, right? They, they campaign style play is a big forward part of most tabletop games. Yeah. There's some modern one shot games, but especially back in the day, you were meant to play your game of D and D until you became a 20th level paladin, which took years. But with board games, playing the same game week in and week out can get rather boring. At least with Catan, you do have that random element that can help minimize perfect games. And that's one reason why Catan is such a long-lived classic and a favorite for tournaments. Now, going back to the question for the next game to play, if you're getting tired of Catan, the easiest suggestion is really to look at Catan. 
because there are a lot of varieties of Catan out there. Many of the Catan expansions significantly changed the feel of the game. Now, I don't know if you remember when I was talking about Cities and Knights of Catan, the way I described it is I think of Catan and Cities of Knights of Catan as two completely different games because they play so differently. They do still have that resource collection, that trading, and that backstabbing of the robber, but there's so much more in Cities and Knights of Catan. So if you're sick of just base Catan, try adding an expansion. Then there's the variations on Catan. There is a Catan dice game that has a Yahtzee-like element where you roll dice to determine your resources. There's the Catan card game, which is recently, well, recently, since I bought Catan, has been renamed to Rivals for Catan. It's probably still 10 years old at this point, but that's a card-based version of Settlers of Catan. Then there's the Chocolate Catan that we played back at uh, our launch party last year. All still Catan, but all still very different. Lastly, there are the themed versions. So there is the Game of Thrones Catan, which in addition to the normal game, you're building the wall. I know nothing about uh, Game of Thrones to know what you're building a wall for, but you're building a wall. I, uh, there's Mongols and Game of Thrones or something. Uh, there's also a bunch of historic games. Uh, the most recent one was Catan History Settlers of America, which kind of combines Catan with the train game. Uh, then there's always the Star Trek version of Catan, which... With the base game is very similar, but there's actually a map that gives you a whole new galaxy to play in. Now, all of these, let your group stick to the game they know and love. It lets them, they love Catan, give them more Catan. But at least it mixes things up a bit, so you're not playing the same game every game night. But that's not quite what David is looking for. No, no, uh, but that is it. Usually what we'll do with Catan is, is break it out. But what I thought was cool about David's question is they're not just looking for another gateway game. Because that was the other way I could have taken this is instead of Catan, you pick up Takanoko or you pick up Power Grid or you pick up Ticket to Ride, the ones he mentioned already, or Azul or Planet or another gateway game, right? Uh, the thing is, David's specifically looking for another game with a similar feel to Catan, a game with some of the same mechanics, which those games I just mentioned aren't really similar to Catan at all, except for the fact they're multiplayer board games you're going to sit down and play with your friends. Uh, David even mentioned some very specific mechanics in his question uh, that he'd like to see for a next step, and that I can work with instead of just listing every gateway game that's ever been published or next step game. So what I'm going to do below is break my suggestions down into sections based on the mechanics David mentioned in his questions. Now, I, based on his question, I saw trading and negotiation, so interaction between the players through that, random resource generation, so you don't know what you're getting every turn, and the robber, so resource stealing. Now, I thought of looking at the last one as just take that games, but again, that opens us up into games like Munchkin, and I can't really see Munchkin as feeling at all like Catan. So I narrowed it down to specifically games where you were stealing resources from other players. So first up, trading and negotiation game recommendations. If the thing you like most about Catan is the trading things between players and negotiations, then these games might be a great change of pace. All right, my number one most recommended trading game. If your favorite part of any game is the interaction of the other players and trading and wheeling and dealing and trying to get the best deal on your stuff, uh, this is another great next step for people who actually enjoy the property training and Monopoly is a game called Chinatown because this is the most pure trading and negotiating game I have ever played. The entire game is negotiations. How well you do is based on the deals you manage to make with the other players. Now, there is a small random element because you draw tiles at the beginning of the turn, but then you draw your tiles and then everyone else draws their tiles and then you open negotiations, completely free open negotiations for those tiles. I'm going to trade you tiles. I'm going to trade you spots on the boards. I'm going to give you tiles and money. I'll tell you what, two turns from now, I want you to give up that building and give it to me. That's all legit and all legal in that game. You can trade any of the resources in the game, including position on the game board. It is very cool. Uh, the only thing that is at all random is the tiles you draw. And I guess technically you could play the game sitting back going, no, I'm not trading and just deal with the random tiles you get every turn. But there is no way you're going to win the game with just blind luck. You know, they did say they like the random element of the dice in Catan as well. So that trading with that random element in there is hitting uh, two spots right away. 
Yeah, very true. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's technically, you're not using dice, but you are randomly generating your resources if you think of the shops as resources. So in Chinatown, you're building Chinatown. So you're opening, um, you know, a, a dim sum place and you're opening a, a aquarium and you're building tiles to own different city blocks. I probably should have tossed in the theme a little bit there. You're building Chinatown. It, it, fantastic trading game. Now, for another trading game that fans of the show will recognize and we've talked about before, and that is Bonanza, or as we like to call it, Bean. This is a classic card game from the 90s that still stands the test of time, which we even just confirmed at our launch party. No, that was my birthday party. Had a big group playing it. Still as fun as it was back in the 90s. Uh, This is one of the lighter, uh, most accessible trading games on the market. The nice advantage it has is that it can play two to seven players. So you're going to be able to play with a larger player count. Though I got to say, I wouldn't play two players. It's throw it out with two players. I would say three to seven players. Yeah. Well, this has the trading ag- aspect and is always a blast. Uh, I feel it may be a bit too narrow for them to move to and still feel like they're getting a full game yeah. the way you do with Catan. So it, it might be something that you can move on to later, but uh, I feel like they might just sort of feel like they got a little skimped on on just the the meat of a game compared to uh, what they're used to with Catan. That is true. Though it does tie in that farming theme. So if they do dig the farming aspect of Catan, that does tie it in as well. Uh, My last recommendation is a game I personally actually don't own. It's not one of my favorite games, but it's another negotiation game. And if it's the negotiation aspect of trading, that you like, not the keeping track of the actual numbers, but that the the bluffing and lying and manipulating and social deduction aspects. Then I'm going to recommend Sheriff of Nottingham. Now, in this game, each round someone plays the sheriff, while the other players are trying to sneak contraband goods into the city. Now, this mixes negotiation, bluffing, and social deduction all into one. Now, this game is also on the lighter side, and it's great for groups with little gaming experience because there isn't a lot of game there. Most of it is all about trying to, like, again, bluff, lie, and negotiate your way through. <laughs> uh, so next up, we have the uh, recommended random resource generation games. If you dig rolling dice to see what resources you can get each round, check out these games. All right. First one just makes sense right from the name, Dice City. Uh, This is a game all about building up a city from humble beginnings to a grand metropolis. Every round, dice are rolled, and it's different colored dice and different numbers, and they go on a grid. And your grid represents the the buildings and things in your city. Uh, Most of these produce resources. So if your die lands on a tree, you get wood. If it lands on a mine, you get stone. You're going to use those resources to build new buildings. And the neat part on this game is those new buildings replace the spots on your board so you get to customize your city. And all dice-based, all resource, all coming up all at once. Uh, If if your favorite part is rolling the two dice and going, okay, I get three wood, I get six this, and I get that, you're going to love Dice City because that's pretty much the entire game. So SimCity meets Sagrada? Is that what I... (laughs) I guess a little bit, though the the placement doesn't matter. Sagrada is way more about placing things in the right space, where this is more of a replace your trees with better trees or decide you don't want to do a wood anymore, so you start replacing everything with smelters so you can get steel or something like that. It's been a while since I played Dice City. These probably aren't actual cards in the game. But the concept is here's your bunch of trees and a couple buildings and replace them with new stuff. Up next, one game we just talked about, I think it was last week, might have been the week before. Yeah, last week. That uh, was last week. It's Valeria Card Kingdoms, because this is probably my favorite dice-based resource generation game. In Valeria, you start off with just a peasant and a knight. You roll dice to generate resources. You use those resources to hire more citizens. You're hiring citizens to defeat monsters, and you're trying to conquer various domains. Uh, The neat twist in Villages of Valeria is that you roll 2d6 to get your resources, but the neat part is both the numbers rolled on the dice and the sum of the dice generate resources, and I've yet to see that elsewhere. Just watch out for that endgame scoring. Yes, uh, scoring on the Dukes. Google it before you do end game scoring, or at least discuss it in your group and yeah, decide how you want to play. Agree on the it. same way, however you want to do it. Yes. All right. Last one I've got with dice rolling is a roll and write game, though you don't actually write anything down because it's tracked on a wooden pegboard. That game is roll through the ages. Excuse me. 
You're going to roll dice Yahtzee style in this one. So you're going to roll your dice. You get another re-roll. You can keep some of them. You're going to re-roll again. You're going to look at the symbols on the dice. Those generate resources. You're going to use those resources to develop technologies, build wonders, and improve your cities. Uh, this is almost a filler level civilization game, but it does kind of give you that whole building up from nothing to something big like a you know an Age of Empires or whatever in a quick dice game. And this one, again, is definitely on the lighter side of what this group is used to. So just be aware of that if you want to look towards this, that it's sort of that you're not going to get that same completionist feeling of that big, bigger game uh, when you play through that. Yeah, very true. There is a, an a expansion for this that is available online called the Late Bronze Age that actually makes it a little more detailed, a little longer, probably gets up to a 45 minute game. And all it is is really new scoring sheets with some rule variants because the dice are used just the right. same. And D uh, pointed out in the chat room that uh, with Valeria, you also get that thing where you st uh, you get stuff from other players on your turn, which is a, a very Catan like. Uh, yeah, that's true. Thing. So the dice, that's a good point. So the dice you roll generate resources for all the players. That's true. In these other games, uh, that's, it's just your own stuff. Right. Like Dice City, Dice City, everyone rolls it once, but they roll their own dice. Uh, roll through the ages, you take your own turn. No one else interacts with you while you're taking your turn. So that is a good call. I missed that. So next up, we have resource stealing games for Catan robber fans. If your favorite part of Catan is stealing resources from other players or playing that Monopoly card right after someone generates 10 wheat, these games may be for you. All right, Alien Frontiers. Uh, this is a dice-based worker placement game where one of the worker placement spots lets you steal resources from another player. So if you happen to get in particular, it's if you can roll a straight on your dice. If you can get three dice in a row, you get to go to, I don't know the name of the spy, I think it's the Alien Outpost. You get to steal resources from another player. Uh, there's another take that element in this game, which is the area control aspect of building colonies on the planet. Whoever owns the majority gets a special ability, and if you go in and sneak in an extra colony, it would take that power away from someone else. Now, an added bonus for this game is the other thing you can do with your dice, and one of the most common actions is use them to generate resources. Now, it's a little different. You're not rolling the dice, and what they roll tells you what to do. Instead, it's a worker placement game, and the numbers on the dice dictate where you can go, and any dice can be put into generating resources. But again, you got dice making resources in a way, so it kind of fits that last category as well. Overall, though, Alien Frontiers is a fantastic game. That's one that, Sean, next time you're down, we've got to play that. Like, this isn't a deck build or anything else. It's just one of those games that's, since I bought it has been fantastic and we need to bring it out again it's it's been a little while it's one of those games that'll come out we'll probably play it 10 times in a row and then it goes on the shelf for six months and then we bring it back out yep uh <clears throat> this one sounds like it's just hitting almost all the check marks off their list of wants so uh I, they, they definitely want to uh, consider strongly now, this one's really divergent as far as feeling like Catan because it's a very different style of game, but there is one part of it that I find very similar, and that's Black Fleet. This is a wonderful pirate theme to pick up and deliver game. you got a map of the Caribbean, you're moving your merchant ships, and you're going from one end of the map to the other, delivering things to different ports. But what needs to be mentioned here is that not only are you moving merchant ships, each player also controls a pirate. Now, players use this pirate piece to steal resources from the other players and actually get bonus points for then taking those resources and burying them on deserted islands where X marks the spot. And I got to say, robbers stealing resources to pirates stealing resources, it's kind of the same thing, thematically at least. Yeah, and I do love a game that can skillfully manage multiple actions like this, uh, similar to the NPCs in Zaya. And it's also a very accessible game. Like that's a gateway game. It's a, it's a, you draw a card and the card tells you how far you move your merchants and how far you move your pirates. Very simple system. Very good game. Also comes with metal money, which is a nice bonus. So if you can get it cheap, Always you good. can steal the money out of it and put it in another game. That was something I didn't even know until I bought it. I opened it. I'm like, Whoa, there's metal money in here. And a box into it looks like a skull and crossbones, which is just neat. Now a game I don't recommend often is Dominion. Now, while it doesn't always have take that, if you include the right cards in the market, it can. Uh, very similar from the, the original game, The Thief, which The Thief, when you play it, makes everyone else overturn two cards, and any copper that comes up, The Thief steals them. So right there, you've got a robber stealing resources. Uh, there's also The Witch, which is a different type of take that card, which adds curse cards to everyone else's deck instead of your own, uh, which basically builds up your deck. They're useless cards, right? They're trash in your deck. There are many other 
Dominion cards that have take that element. Those are just two that I happen to know from the base set. Uh, plus, a lot of people recommend this one as the next step to Catan. It's got kind of that city building feel if you actually read what's on the cards instead of just what the cards do. You're building up small hamlets and trying to raise money to build up provinces and territories. So you still got that that settlement feeling to it. You know, as we go through all this, uh, it seems that while many more experienced gamers tend to frown on Catan, there really aren't that many games that have mm -hmm. all those same elements you get from the good old standby. Yeah, that's the one thing I would love to hear. If there's someone out there that can think of one game that combines all three of those, like a, a literal step up from, from Catan, I, I'd love to hear about it because I couldn't think of one. Like there's other aspects of Catan that I really like, like the random max map generation with hexes, which is not something that David looked for. So I didn't even bring it, put it into the list, but that's something else we could have talked about, right? Like there you're looking at like Zaya. I, though Zaya's kind of pushing it, but there are other games that use the hex generation. Uh, one recommendation, it's an odder one for people that might want to check out. It's an independent published game from Canada called Stratos. We talked about it a bit on the show before. It claims to be Magic the Gathering meets Catan. I don't know if I quite agree with that, but it does have random tile generations. You're rolling dice to generate income. Uh, there is player versus player combat in that one. Your player's pieces can attack other players i it's it's one i haven't played enough to throw it in as a strong recommendation but it's one you can look at yeah. so counting that last one there you have 10 games that not only are great next step games but actually incorporate some of the feel and mechanics of settlers of Catan. now if you can think of any other Catan like games that david's group may enjoy be sure to let us know here in the comments on social media or through email now, uh, with the Catan buzz in the lobby, uh, we have uh, Major Kayla saying that uh, their first move onto was Power Grid, which seems yep. like a bit of a big step from uh, from Catan. But uh, that one comes up as recommendations often uh, in the blog post I included at the bottom, as as where I didn't actually talk about the games, where I just said other next step games because again, it doesn't tie in any of the trading resource generation or anything like that. None none of the stuff David was looking for, but a lot of people do consider that a next step to Power Grid, or sorry, from Catan. And I got to admit, for me, it was. So from Catan, we played Carcassonne, then we moved on to El Grande, Power Grid, and kind of that level of game. So it is a it is a common next step. Power Grid, for all the people complain about it, really isn't that tough a game. Just there is math involved. Yeah. Uh, a lot of uh, dislike for Sheriff Nottingham, not people's <laughs> favorite game. It uh, is extremely popular, just not popular with the people I play with for whatever yeah. reason. It, it People love it. It's it's ranked fairly high on Board Game Geek. People do dig the game. There's a reason I don't own it, though. People around here don't seem to like it much. And then Shadzar uh, points out that uh, Catan at its core is just an RTS simulation for gaining points. <laughs> well, it, it's actually a race. That's what yeah. a lot of people don't realize in Catan. It's a race. Yeah. It's who can do it first. It's a race to 10 points, which is another thing we could have talked about. Games where the, the where any game where the score, the game ends when you hit a set score is actually a race game, okay. whether there's cards or not. Uh, so that was a different aspect of Catan, which probably would have gave me a totally different list of three games. I would have recommended if you were looking for games with that type of scoring. I saw Major Kayla mentioned, um, Dice Forge. That was one I almost put on the list. You know what? I had it there. I thought about it. I don't actually own it. I've only played it on board game arena. And I was thinking, yes, you're using dice to generate resources, but there's only two resources and they're only, they're used to buy cards. It could have been on there. Uh, if I played it more often, I think it could have been on there. Uh, and she was, and apparently she went to uh, uh, Power Grid because they only knew of Mayfair and Avalon Hill beyond the, the yep. Parker Brother world. Well, to be honest, it was the same thing, right? It's it's you get Catan, you open up, it comes with a pamphlet that lists other Mayfair games in there. Yep. So that was Rio Grande. Right. Uh, four things to roll in uh, uh, Dice Forge. There's four. Okay, I was thinking there's only the two different, the red stuff and the blue stuff. Again, I, I've only played it on Board Game Arena, so. Right. Oh, money and victory points, too. Okay. There you go. All right. So yeah, Dice Forge definitely fits. Well, that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. If you'd like to read about gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you'll see plenty of topics answered in blog form. And remember, if you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so if you haven't yet, please take a moment 
subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share to your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive Tabletop and Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, previews, unboxings, anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Now, Origins Game Fair is just over a month away at this point. It's coming up quick. While I'd love to say the entire Belltop team will be there as we were at Breakout, that's just not the case. At least not this year. Uh, due to Deanna recovering from surgery and this hitting during a busy time of the year for Sean, it looks like I'm going to be flying solo. It's a shame the rest of the team aren't able to make it this year for sure, but we're already in talks to see if we can't change that for next year. So right now, my schedule is pretty open. I've got some Hydro Hackers. I'm going to be playing some Iron Edda and some Dungeon World, and I'm attending a couple panels. And that's it. That's all that's on my schedule, and it's a five-day con. So if anyone's looking to be, meet up, be sure to contact me before that weekend. I'm pretty sure i got room in my schedule. Lo and behold, there's actually a Gloomhaven update this week. This past Friday, we played and streamed not one but two two-player dungeons and baptized the game. Uh, we did something a bit different this time. Uh, this time around, I didn't actually play the game. Instead, I played moderator, basically acting as dungeon master for Tori and Kat. Uh, we did this because both our orchids are babies and need some XP and Tori needs some time to get used to his new character. The doom. I always get it wrong. Doom seeker is wrong. Doom something. Or I had a spiky headed guy. Flower archer guy. Yeah, Flower Archer. <laughs> Overall, I think it went rather well, except for the coffee tsunami that Sean kind of mentioned earlier and thankfully edited out of the YouTube video. But don't worry, that video is not lost and may appear in a special release once I get the right soundtrack. <laughs> soundtrack, oh God. And yes, for those of you who saw the mess, which actually I had people coming up to me at the local game store on Saturday going, oh my God, is your gloom wave and okay? All the components seem fine. Uh, we acted quickly. And thankfully, Tim Hortons isn't as horrible as, say, beer or wine for board games. Uh, you know, if you ever play uh, Neil's copy of Catan, there's a, a definite red wine tint to all of his, his pieces because they've had many tsunamis of Catan. As for the actual game, though, I think it went rather well, especially the the fact um we were able to fit two games in and it went good despite what the planning phase banter may sound like for those of you listening uh for those of you who do watch do know that they do love each other and any jabs are all in good fun yes even with their wicked week wicked wit weekly at the table they still managed to get married <laughs> yes uh it went well enough um had more than enough fun playing DM. I think next time we're going to do the same thing. So this coming Friday, uh, hopefully by the weekend after that, Deanna will be doing better, be feeling much better, and maybe we can get back to our full campaign. But this Friday, we're looking for another two-player dungeon. We'll get a little bit more XP. You get to hear me do silly monster voices. Maybe I won't use the, the sound effect thing this time. I don't know. It worked really good for the gibbering things. I just need the one goblin sound. Uh, but yeah, we'll be back doing Gloomhaven Friday. Usual time, usual place, and then hopefully the week after we'll go back to our full campaign. So join us Friday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and watch Tori and Cat bicker and fight and somehow still manage to win the day, at least we hope. <laughs> and now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tabletops? Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. So this week, I've got some mixed feelings on ter uh, Terraforming Mars expansion. I take a first look at a game called Tiny Towns from Alderic Entertainment Group, or AEG, and then I finally got Brass Birmingham off my pile of shame. You can stop bugging me about it. Well, for me, I was playing Duke with my boy, and I've got to say, he has been keeping pace with me. We are split 50-50 over, uh, over the life nice. of our, our game so far. Uh, and it's, it's been pretty, uh, it, you know, I, I sort of, I come out with, a, I'll usually come out with a strong win, but uh, on the longer games, he seems to be uh, catching me out. So Nice. Is yeah. it actual strategy or random got the lucky draw from the bag? 
Uh, no, actually, there's there's a good bit of strategy in there. Uh, usually, if I lose, it's uh, a bad draw on his part uh, a lot of times. Right. Nice. Good to know. Yeah. So last week was Deanna and my anniversary. Deanna got me a copy of Terraforming Mars Colonies in order to celebrate. And fittingly, the first game we played was just the two of us uh, over at her mom's house while she was recovering. So we got in a two-player game. Now, everyone knows how much I love Terraforming Mars. Uh, I've talked about it many, many, many times on the show. Uh, at this point, Colonies was the only expansion I didn't own, but it's one I heard a lot of good things about. So just to kind of look at the previous expansions and my thoughts on them to kind of give you some perspective. Uh, to me, Preludes, Prelude, I always want to say Preludes, it's not plural, it's Prelude, is a must-own expansion. If you own Terraforming Mars, go buy Prelude, put it in the box, keep it in there. Every time you play Terraforming Mars, use Preludes. I, it, it's a must-have. I, I love it. It makes the game slightly shorter, but it gives you direction at the beginning of the game, which I find very important when you got a hand of 10 project cards and you're not sure what to do with them. Hellas and Elysium is nice to have. Now, this is just a map expansion. It's a two-sided board. I don't love it. I, I don't mind using the base map, but you know what? It's nice to toss in now and then. Where I like to grab this is when I play with people I played with like 10 or more times already. So I go down to the CG realm, and it's a group where everyone at the table has played Terraforming Mars many times and knows the rules. That's when I'll throw down one of the variant maps just to keep it interesting. Venus Next so far was my least favorite expansion, but I do dig it. The thing is, most of the other people in my game group don't like it at all, one of them being Deanna. Which is somewhat amusing because Dee slayed everyone using the expansion when she did <laughs> play it, but we also know there's no real joy in a landslide victory. Competition is king. Yeah, it's always a, a good indicator. If someone doesn't like so wins the game and still doesn't like it, that's usually a sign that there, there's an issue with that that thing. I, I don't mind Venus Next. I, it doesn't bother me. To me, it's take her to leave it. And usually I end up leaving it because the other people I tend to play with don't like it. So it's one of those ones that usually when I put the game away, the Venus cards are sorted out. They're not actually in with everything else. So when we start up the play, I don't have to do that. So now moving on to Colonies. So our first play of Colonies, we use the base map. We kept in Preludes because, like I said, Preludes use it all the time. And it doesn't mess with the game. Like, it's not going to break an expansion. But I took out Venus Next because I wanted to know how Colonies played. Plus, I was playing with Deanna, and she doesn't like Venus Next. Now, this two-player only game, just the two of us, took us almost four hours. And it was not only long, but it was a slog. Like, we were just going through the motions. After the first hour, I was like 99% certain, maybe 95% certain, I had no chance of winning. At that point, Deanna had way too much income, and she had these combos going on using colonies and bacteria that I there was no way for me to compete with. And as it played out for another three hours, I was right. We probably could have called the game at an hour and a half and saved of two to two and a half hours of me just watching her rack up a massive score while I did almost nothing. It was actually so bad. I was like tweeting and doing stuff on my phone because her turns took so long and mine were like, I play one card and I pass. And then she would do 20 things while I went online. Now, I my, my bad. I almost suggested calling the game, but I thought she was having fun. Plus, it's like our anniversary, and I bought the game over for us to play, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to play because I'm losing. I didn't want to be a sore loser. But after the game, she pointed out, she almost said something for her side, because as Schwan pointed out, runaway leader, uh, a landslide victory is not fun either. She knew she had the game won, but was still going through the steps. So both of us basically went through the paces for like two and a half hours. And now that's two expansions for the game that, along with some other concerns we'll get to, seem to be poorly balanced. No, I agree. Or something, at least at two players. Like, now, looking back on it, there are a few things that I think led to this disparity in score. And almost all of them come down to luck, right? It's, it's all about the luck of the project cards. Deanna kept getting project cards that accumulated cubes, right? So things you put onto your cards, like whatever it is, animals or bacteria or plants, and you accumulate them. At the end of the game, there were so many points for so many cubes. And it just ended up that these cards she had matched the colonies you had in play. Because in colonies, you get these new spots you can take an action to go to to get various resources. Well, one of them was she could go there and get the bacteria card things. And she could get like 10, like, I don't even know, 
three to ten of them a turn or whatever. She just kept using the trade action to get more and more cubes. And like by the end of the game, she had an ant card and it had 28 cubes on it. I've never seen that in any game of Catan. Like usually those scoring cards, you're like, you get one to three points off of. She got 14 points just from ants. And the other thing was in colonies, there are cards that give you more fleets, which allow you to take more trade actions. It was so bad that we thought we were going to run out of fleets while playing, but it ends up there are just enough in the box because she got all three of the extra ones. So just by random luck, she got them all. I got none. So Deanna gets all the fleets. So every turn she can fly to four colonies and get four different things. Meanwhile, I could go to one. It just, there, there was nothing I could do. Now, it's concerning to see this same runaway problem emerging again, uh, especially when there's already another expansion lined up and, and funded. Uh, you yeah. Know, uh, Major Kayla's got all the expansions coming with this next Kickstarter uh, uh, purchase. So it's, I'm, you know, it's worrying. Yeah, I'll admit I backed the I backed the Kickstarter. I don't I don't kickstart a lot of stuff, but Terraforming Mars I enjoy it enough. I did back that new Kickstarter with some faith uh, that they've fixed things or it will be better balanced. So the other thing that came up that I couldn't believe is we ran out of components for the game. We ran out of the colored cubes. Like that just shouldn't happen because with colonies adding in, at least with two players. You have so many different things you have to mark with your color. Your fleets are marked by your color. Your colonies are marked by your color, as well as all the stuff that was already marked by your color. All your blue cards as you use them are marked by your color. Um, all the stuff you build on the board, your cities and, and trees and everything else are marked with your color. We ran out. We literally had to dive in because we were two, playing two-player and grab the components for the colors we weren't using and, and use those. But that's just, I don't know, like, if you're going to need that many, put more cubes in the game. I found that disappointing. The other one is, it seems like Venus is a required expansion with colonies, though there's nothing in the box that says you must play with Venus, but there are a ton of what they call floater cards in colonies. So Venus next added a new resource called floaters, and it actually added a new milestone for whoever has the, not the most floaters, but like gets to a certain number. I don't remember how many floaters it is. First player to five floaters, say. So Venus is all about these things called floaters. Well, there's all these floater cards in colonies. And they're only really useful if you're playing Venus next. Otherwise, they're just useless cards you draw. Now, I have played a second time which i'll get to in a minute so i do know there is at least one card in colonies that uses those floaters but to have like 15 to 20 other cards tied to one card just isn't right the rule book also adds in a new phase to the game that you only use if you're using venus so again it seems like like i get it marketing they're like we don't want to put requires venus next on the box but i think it's pretty strongly implied so overall, I'm sure you can tell, uh, that first play, I was unimpressed. Uh, now, based on feedback online, everyone else seems to dig it. And I don't really see anyone else complaining about the same problems, especially like, I saw no one else complaining about the component problem. So I'm actually wondering if all of this is due to the fact we only played two players. So the designers clearly want you to go all in with your expansions. Um, and that's understandable especially from a marketing standpoint. Mm -hmm. But my concern is that they haven't play tested their own variations. So if they, you know, come up with a new component and add that into their play testing package and play test with everything up to and including the new system and it works great. But have they looked at the possibility of, well, what happens if you take out expansion a or expansion mm -hmm. B and play with that? Uh, and, and that's a little bit of what I'm, I'm feeling may have happened. Yeah, I, I couldn't tell you for sure, but that does seem possible. Or I think the designer thinks, like, told the public, like, in the designer's mind, you play with everything. But then the publisher is like, well, hell no, because no one's going to buy everything, except Major Kayla is going to buy it through the Kickstarter. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, possibly the designer very strongly feels everything should be included, because that happens, right? But then the publisher is like, no, we want to be able to sell these things piecemeal so people buy what they want. I don't know. I That's behind the scenes stuff. I don't have that insider info. But it does seem to be a problem. So 
thinking possibly that it's a two player only problem, I really wanted to play again. So when there was a game night at the CG Realm local game store on Saturday, I brought Colonies. And I showed up and everyone's like, what do you want to play? And I'm like, we're playing Terraforming Mars with Colonies with five players tonight. I don't care when, I don't know when we're going to fit it in, but that's what I want to do before I go home. So that's what we did. And this time, the other thing I did was put Venus next in to test that theory as well. I realized bad, I should only change one variable. I'm doing bad experiments here. I should only change one variable at a time to put it next to my control. But I put in what I, ex I basically gave colonies the best chance it could by putting in everything I thought would make it good. Now I did got to say it worked mostly. Uh, it was so much better. Like it was actually enjoyable. I didn't feel like quitting after an hour and a half and I didn't feel any need. And at the end, we didn't know necessarily who won the game. It was still up in the air till the very end. Uh, with this many players, fleets were evenly spread. The, the, the one player ended up with two fleets, but other than that, there was no one monopolizing the fleets. Um, the other thing is with the colonies is you can eat, there can only be three colonies on each they're not planet moon whatever each each card can only have three colonies with two players that meant we could both be on all of them so there was no competition there with five there was fierce competition to get on those colonies because once there were three the other two players were left out so that made a big difference uh the actual colony rewards actually had time to build up because someone didn't have fleets and didn't go to them every turn so the colonies slowly grow every turn um so things built up and they weren't stolen every turn and we didn't have any ridiculous card combos with 28 micro carbs on ants it just it didn't happen it was there was a bit of an animal combo going on but again it, i think it maybe got five or six cubes on it by the end of the game no 28 cubes and i gotta say having venus in did seem to help quite a bit um and that new rule the new rule is actually it was an amusing role. There's a lot of amusing stuff behind the scenes in Terraforming Mars if you read the flavor text. And what happens is that the government gets pissed off that the players aren't paying attention to Mars and they're terraforming Venus, so they step in every year to terraform it themselves, which I thought was cute. And that rule was awesome. I actually really liked it. Here I thought I wouldn't like something that sped up the game, but what it does is it gives the first player... At the end of the round, after everyone's generated resources, the chance to terraform Mars, but get no reward for it. So they put out a lake, or they increase the oxygen, or they increase the temperature, but that's it. They don't get anything for it. But I thought that was neat, because there was some strategy in there on making sure no one got like that bonus heat, or making sure to place a lake so that no one got the titanium. It was a... It actually added something to the game. Plus, it helped cut the game back from not being four hours long. Well, it's encouraging that we're, we're seeing some some... You know, improvement over that first play. Yeah. Now, I did mention it wasn't perfect. And again, we started to see a runaway leader problem, though. Now, in here, I did say there was no clear winner to the end. But there were two players that we were pretty sure were the only two that had a chance. The rest of us were well behind. Uh, those two players were generating 80 mega credits a turn, while the rest of us were generating like 30. That gave them a huge advantage. Uh, so it seems to me that with each expansion, the big thing that's changing is the luck factor, right? Just getting the right cards at the right time and happening to get, especially a money combo going early seems to almost guarantee you the game. Now, I can't help but think that this all might be fixed by just using the drafting variant. But the one time we tried drafting, it added an hour and a half to a base game. And I'm just worried about adding drafting to one of these that it's going to become just too long. So what I'm really hearing here is that if you want to eliminate an expansion, eliminate everything that came after that expansion that you've eliminated as well. Um, yeah, possibly. And and I, I, I'm i strongly thinking that, you know, drafting may be part of that, right? If, 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 yeah. if they're including everything in their setup and their testing – so when they when they play the game, they expect you know everything up to X has is there. Drafting would be part of that, mm -hmm. um, and so they're expecting that to be used. And their their gameplay experience is based around something with drafting. So if they are if they're always drafting, they aren't seeing the random elements that can lead to runaway. Yeah, no, oh, very true. So an example of drafting when we were playing two player, the thing I did in Deanna's game is I tried to build up a steal 
thing. So with preludes or whatever, I end up with like three or four steel generation right at the start of the game. And I took a corporation that got steel and I just went, I'm going to get lots of steel. I'm going to try to win the builder milestone. I'm going to try to get the, um, I don't remember the name of it, metallurgist or whatever award like that. That's my goal. I get all this set up. I'm generating a ridiculous amount of steel. Like I had over 30 steel sitting in my thing and all my steel was worth four each. So it's just a ton of resources and five turns in a row. I did not draw a building, single building project. So out of my four cards, none of them had that building tag. So this, again, worries me something Deanna thought with Venus is that the decks are getting watered down the more cards they put in. So now the ratio of building cards to not building cards isn't the same. Now, I do swear if we played with drafting, I would have got at least one building card. Because Deanna, like now I'm looking at a hand of eight, right? Like Deanna's going to keep one card. I'm going to keep one card. Then we're going to pass our cards. So I'm now getting a choice out of seven cards. So the odds of getting that one building card so I can at least reuse my resources is significantly increased. And the same thing, if you're collecting floaters, the odds of getting that one floater card, if you didn't draw it, that someone drew it and it's going to get passed to you is a lot higher. Now, of course, that does add in the take that element where you can hate draft, where you look and go, oh, Mo's collecting floaters. I'm not going to pass it to him. But I think there's going to be, in, especially in Terraforming Mars, it's more multiplayer solitaire. Even if you got that floater card, there's probably another card that's better for your engine that you're probably going to keep and pass it on. I really do think it might fix the game. I just I don't want to play Terraforming Mars for five hours. Yep. Like, I do like the game, but part of what I like is that I can get it in in about two and a half, three hours at the most. So up next is a game called Tiny Towns. Now, this is one that I don't own. This was uh, the demo game of the day. And it fits into a growing category of games that just seems to have kind of blossomed in the last couple of years. There seems to be a number of these quick to teach, easy to learn games that like, I wouldn't say under five minutes for Tiny Towns, but like short teaching, very basic mechanics. The actual actions you take are simple, but the implications of those actions can be huge for points. So I'm thinking of games like Azul, Sagrada, Planet. Tiny Towns, I think, fits into those group of games, but it's a step, a, a step up in difficulty. So what you're doing here is you're given a player board with a grid, and I apologize for not remembering how big the, big the grid is. It might be four by four, or it might be five by five, but just a big square grid. Uh, each turn, the starting player is going to call it a resource. So they're going to say wood or glass or brick or wheat. And I think there might be one more stone, I think. Uh, then every player has to take a cube for that resource and put it somewhere on their grid. And you can only put one resource in each square on the grid. Then the next player is going to call it a resource. Then the next player is going to call it a resource. And every time, everyone has to take that resource that's called out. Now, once you've got these cubes in the proper pattern, you can then remove the cubes and replace them with a building. So, for example, a well requires one wood and one stone next to each other. So as soon as you place a wood and a stone next to each other, you can go, I can build a well. You take those off and replace it by like a, a well wooden token. Uh, a house or manor or whatever they were called was one glass. Next to that was a grain and a brick. And eventually your grid fills with buildings forming a tiny town. That's the name of the game. Uh, each of the different buildings scores differently at the end of the game. So, for example, Wells got points for being next to houses. Houses got points as long as they were fed. Farms fed houses. Churches doubled the value of houses if they were fed and so on. Um, taverns, I remember, were worth more the more you had. So one tavern was worth one point, but two was worth three, and it Fibonacci'd up. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a four-by-four four grid on this one. Okay. Um, and it's, it's one of the things I like is that the art and things that they went with, it's a, it's a fun sort of light game, mm -hmm. and they didn't go with people. So they didn't have to worry about things that we've mm -hmm. complained about in some things because, you know, it's animals. Uh, it's, yes. you know, there's, there's mice and toads and lizards and, and things uh, on there. So you don't have to worry about gender and race and things. And they've just kept it nicely neutral because on a game like this, there's no need to have any of that. But you do want some sort of something on the art just to give it a, a little something. Uh, now, looking through this, one of the things I see is there's how, almost a Minecraft sort of connection to this uh, because you need to memorize these recipes and, you know, placing uh, things in there. It's just instead of crea crafting tools, mm -hmm. you're crafting buildings. Yeah, no um, memorization required. It's out on cards. It is, but I, but I can definitely see how even with those cards out there, memorizing it would just sort of help you and, and help the game move along faster. Yeah, I could see that. So what this reminded me the most of is a fantastic, highly addictive app called Triple Town. 
If you haven't tried Triple Town, seriously, everyone get that. It's on Android, iOS. It's free. They're going to want money for it to unlock other stuff. It was a game on Apple I actually paid for a subscription for to get rid of the ads because it was that good. And all that game is is you put down three things and they big groups. So you start off with a bush, you put another bush, if you put a third bush down and they're touching, they turn into a tree. And then you put three trees and they turn into another bigger thing. Super addictive game. Man, this reminded me of that because trying to plan out where your buildings are going to go. So when your cubes disappear and you put out the building was like triple town and you're always like, you didn't leave enough room. It's difficult. Uh, it also reminded me of a weird arena battle game called Tash Kalar where you're putting down tokens and trying to match patterns on your cards to cast spells. Uh, the scoring really reminded me of Between Two Cities, which I think you played that at our launch party. And the whole, this many buildings next to these, the scoring is very similar. And then there's a Railroad Inc. element, because the thing I thought was cool in Railroad Inc. was that everyone's starting with the same resources. Well, this is the exact same. We all are building our town out of the exact same resources given to us in the exact same order. Yet at the end of the game, at least in the game I played, all four of our boards were completely different. Like they were not even close. I dig it. I, I really like Tiny Towns. This was not one that was really on my radar. Like I've seen some buzz on the podcast and on Twitter, but it wasn't one I was like rushing to try. So I thought it was cool to try it. Now we did play the base introduction. So it was like whatever the set buildings you can play and i guess you can shuffle them so instead of just like buildings there's different ones so there's different colors for each of the building and you can shuffle each there's a deck of each and then there's rules for monuments and i have no idea what those are uh but it's something i do want to try in the future now i gotta admit at this point i don't feel i must own this but if i had spare money in the gaming budget right now i would definitely consider picking it up the uh the comments i see are people are concerned about its replayability long term um whether or not it stays fun, but uh, no, it definitely looks like a, a fun little sort of game to pull out and uh, and have there. It's uh, you know not too heavy and uh, quick and easy. It's another one that AAG is really famous for this, making games that look like they can be easily expanded. So all you'd have to do is throw in a new card and that's right. it. Not even and, and new meeple to replace it. You wouldn't need new resources, and they'd use a different pattern, and all of a sudden you'd have a new. You know, it's one of those, there's already quite a bit of variation with the different buildings. Again, I don't know how many are in each deck. It, it, it didn't look like a lot, but there's at least multiples of all those basic buildings. Uh, and I see in the BGG files that there are already alternate cards and things yeah. that can be printed out. So the see, game is already house ruling quickly. Does not surprise me at all. All right. Every single time I share a picture of my piles of shame, I have people, especially on Twitter and Instagram, yell at me for having Brass Birmingham in that picture. Everyone's like, what the heck? How come? How could you have that not played? It's the best game of 2017. You have to play it. And I'm like, I have had Brass. I've owned Brass since it came out in whatever, 2010 or something. And I own Brass Lancashire, which is the updated version. And I played that. And I'm like, so I play Brass. I'll get to this one eventually. And everyone's like, but Birmingham is better. You have to play it. And I'm like, geez, okay, fine, fine. That can all stop now, all right? You can stop telling me I got to play Brass. I got it done. I played it on Saturday. I played in a three-player game. Uh, two players I played with had played before. Ironically, with my copy of the game, actually, even though I hadn't played it. Um, uh, the best part of that, the, possibly the best part of the whole experience was I didn't have to teach this game. That, like, never happens. That was so nice to just sit back and, like, what, well, like, we're ready to play? I don't have to explain where things, wow, that's awesome. Honestly, it's strange to hear. I mean, <laughs> you teach games to people. That's what you do. Yep. Um, so to hear a game, you playing a game and not teaching it is just, just bizarre. Yeah, it, it felt kind of weird and, and freeing and relaxing. And I was just like, oh, I, I can just sit down and play. I, we do get to do that with Terraforming Mars pretty often. Even then, though, there's always like that one player who hasn't tried play loots or the one player who, who, of course, nowadays hasn't seen colonies. Actually, when we played the five player game, the, there was one player there who hadn't played preludes and one player who hadn't played colonies. So we basically had to do the full teach for both of those. Now, I'm not going to get into the rules for Brass or or the different editions, but I, it just Brass is good. The, the entire series is good. Like, all combined, just thinking of the Brass franchise as a whole, they are my favorite games by Martin Wallace. Uh, they continue to be just as engaging and rewarding as my first play of the original, very, very ugly game of Brass. Um, the new ones are just better versions of the original. Uh 
so far as to say I sold my original copy. There's no reason to seek out the original brass. It's not like a collector's item. It looks ugly, and there are slight minor improvements in the new ones. Now, comparing Lancashire, which is the, the updated version of the original game, to this new version, Birmingham, I haven't decided which I like better. Um, I was surprised by how different they feel when playing. Like the base system and most of the rules are identical, but there's two new types of industries and there's a new consumable resource, beer, which really changes up how Birmingham feels compared to the other games. But even more so was the demand counter. So in the original Lancashire and Brass, you just had to make a network to one of the ports at the edge of the board or a port that one of the players built. That's something that doesn't exist in this. And you could sell anything on the board at any time. Like you made the connection, you can sell it. The difference in this is each port only wants different goods. And man, that's something I need to get used to because multiple times during Saturday's game, I would build, say, a cotton mill and then be like, all right, I'm going to sell that to Berkshire. And they're like, oh, Berkshire doesn't want it. And I'm like, oh, that's right. You have to look at the demand counters. Uh, that's probably what lost me the game. You know, and I just find this mildly amusing because <laughs> you're experiencing games the way I play almost all the time uh, when I jump into something new. Uh, that feeling that you're getting it only to realize that you've missed an entire portion and have uh, uh, yep. completely ruined things. Yeah, yep. I, I came in third place by far. Now, this is only my first time playing Birmingham. Uh, I, what I've felt like, though, is just there was way more on my plate, way more to juggle. Uh, there were more things to think about and more options to consider. So to me, it seems like Birmingham is a heavier, harder game with more thinking required to play well than Lancashire. Now, I'm not sure on Board Game Geek. It might be worth looking up to see if the weight is higher. It did feel like that to me. Now, what I don't know, as often happens, like when I compare King Domino and Queen Domino, is if this is a good thing or a bad thing or just a thing. Now, I would never call Brass Lancashire light, but I think I might prefer the slightly more decision, narrower decision space in that original game. But overall, like I, I, it's like complaining about winning the lottery, right? Like, like both these games are excellent. Birmingham was still a fantastic game. I made some mistakes. I know what those mistakes are. I'll play better next time. It was still excellent. Both of the brass games are some of the best games in my collection. I just not sure which of the two I like better. Uh, at this point, they are both exactly the same, uh, almost for rating and weight. Uh, and the only difference between them is that Birmingham comes up as a best of th best three player, while Lancashire comes up as best four. Oh, interesting. I did play it three players. So I guess I played it at the proper player count. I don't know. It, it's just there's more to think about. Maybe it's just a different way of thinking. I, I'll have to play more and then I'll know. So I already mentioned Brass Birmingham came off the pile of shame. Yes, you stopped making fun of me for it. So the count should go down one, but yet again, wait, there's another box that came in. We have Gentis, the deluxified, I hate that word, edition hot off Kickstarter. So right now we're sitting at the same, goes down, goes back up, sits the same. I uh, look forward to an unboxing video of Gentis coming sometime soon. I don't know if I'll get to it this week or next week. All righty. So now we talked about what we played since last update. Is there anything you're excited to get to the table next week? You know, I'm really hoping uh, that we can get back to this, some DC for some crisis, uh, as we actually still have two crisis expansions mm -hmm. we haven't even tried yet. Uh, just because we haven't had much luck with the first one that we've been holding off. But uh, I think the next thing I'm going to try for is uh, Crisis uh, 2 and see how that goes. Sounds good. For me, I have one of the biggest bear games in the world potentially going on Saturday night. I may have a group together to play Twilight Imperium 4th Ooh. Edition. <laughs> so uh, we're is working that a on Charles uh, game. Or? No, no, not Charles. Chad, uh, Chad, okay. who I've talked about a couple times. Uh, again, someone I only met recently in the last couple of years. He finally went out and bought a copy. Uh, his agreement was that I had to play with him and his gaming group has to agree to play it once a year and he would spend the money on it. <laughs> so I, I agreed to put together the game night. Uh, we're just not sure if it's going to come together right now. We have three players. I'm going to be looking for six players. Just Chad had a conflict of interest come up and he's supposed to get back to me tonight. If my phone was not on airplane mode, I could see, and I may have an answer for you. 
I don't plan on streaming this. Um, I don't even know if the people I'm inviting would be comfortable with streaming this. So, But you may get to hear my thoughts on the beast that is Twilight Imperium 4th Edition. And I am a fan of and have had quite a few, not many plays, because I don't think anyone's had many plays of Twilight Imperium. But the 3rd Edition was is up there in my, my game list, and I have played it more than five times. And the 4th the Edition right now is on sale for 20% off on Amazon.com. There you go. Click the link down under our video there and uh, find it. 20% off. It's still expensive. It's still over. It's still $120. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it is yeah. not a cheap game. Yeah. yeah, it's supposed to be like a, a, I don't know. The original game was more like 9 to 12 hours. I hear this one's like 6 to 8. So it'll be an interesting night if we can get it scheduled. So that, that's what I am looking forward to, hoping that works. Uh, other than that, I don't know. We'll see. That that might be the only thing on my, my schedule this weekend. So they claim... 480 minutes, uh, or two foot, 240 to 480 minutes. On so what's that? Week. That's four hours, uh, four no, to eight they, hours, four to eight. Yeah. yeah. See, they, they at least that's closer than a lot of people claim they can finish the original in five. And you know what? No, it, it was like eight to 12 and this will be the uh, learning game for all of us. Cause none of us have played fourth edition and actually Chad and Justin, who are the people who signed up so far, haven't played third edition, which I, again, I don't know that may or may not help. You never know with these games because, like, me playing Flash Lancashire helped with Brass Birmingham except for that whole selling to ports part. So so at this point, we're nearing the end of the show. We're going to take one final stop by the lobby to see what's up. So Major Kayla is uh, sort of, we'll find out, worst case, we don't play all the expansions, talking about uh, the Terraforming Mars uh, Kickstarter where they've got yeah. all the new, all the expansions up to date coming in. Yeah, don't don't let me scare you away from no, no, definitely give them a try, Mars. Like the the other thing, too, right? If if you don't mind the random factor, if you're playing the game as an event, right, as a story, which I think Major Kayla's group is probably going to be, well, except maybe her husband, more into the experience of it as opposed to the competition. It's still fun. It's still a good game. You're still building projects, and there's still the small joy of getting your own card combos and building your own engine. It's just we play it a lot, right? So I'm fairly critical on the game. Um, and like I said, don't just don't play colonies with two people. That seems to be the biggest thing. And if you're going to use colonies, it seems like keep Venus next in. But and, always and, keep and consider trailer. you know consider drafting if you can uh, spare the yeah. time. That does seem to uh, <clears throat> sort of yeah deal with the the random factor to some degree. Yeah, it should. Uh, yeah, I haven't really tested it yet. Uh, and Shadzar was talking about uh, just going with Munchkin if you want to play. Uh, Something up uh, from, if, uh, if you want to take that game, there's still, there's almost nothing better. It's, it, it's a thing. The problem with Munchkin is the game is designed to not end because the entire point in Munchkin, it's another race. It's a race to level 10. And as soon as someone gets closed, everyone gangs up on that player and it's designed to do that. The problem is if that's the case, it's possible no one could win. And that's when Munchkin sucks is when you sit down to play a 15-minute, half-hour game of Munchkin, and it goes two and a half hours. So my secret to playing Munchkin is you set a time limit. You say, we are going to play Munchkin, but at 11 o'clock, whoever's highest level wins. And then it's a, a fine game. Because Munchkin's fun. Like, I, I know a lot of hobby gamers hate the game. I don't hate it. It just, every now and then, it goes on too long. And if you can just stop it from going on too long, you'll have fun. It just It's the same thing with Flux. Any of those take that games, right? Anything where you can stop someone from winning and that prolongs the game. Epic Spell Wars, Duel at Mount Skullfire is another example. Any of those games where when someone's winning, everyone can gang up on them to knock them back. You could end up playing indefinitely. Just to prove it's a problem, Mage Kayla says they annoyed the rep from Steve Jackson Games because it, they wouldn't end the learning game. Yeah, see? Exactly. <laughs> yeah see there table of seven we went through four almost winners until the fifth one did that yeah. it's by design that like steve jackson games that's that's the point of munchkin it's just you have to know that going in and yeah. and i think mitigate for it and now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our patreon backers their support helps make this show possible william fisher thank you danielle thomas thank you P.S. Goujon, thanks. Andrew Dacey, thanks. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. That was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. 
Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, it would be awesome if you would consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Hang around and join us in the Pendo Suite for the Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on. <laughs>